What's going on guys, Jason Mojo here, Nine Figure Advertiser. I work with some of the biggest brands and personalities on the internet, and I wanna welcome you to the podcast. Most people who sell shit online, they got into entrepreneurship to get rich. They did not get into entrepreneurship to build a good business. A lot of people struggle with that because they allow their emotions to get in the middle of that consistency. Consistency actually shapes the way for you to outcompete everybody else who isn't willing to stay consistent. What is the question that people should be asking you when it comes to running profitable paid ads? When you tell somebody who's a business owner, hey, I want you to go look at your take rate on your third upsell. Uh, why, do, why do I want to look at that? The ads aren't performing. No, you dumbass. I had a couple of clients. They weren't 100% happy. I took that personal. Some people are just really fucking needy. They try to rip the absolute life out of you sometimes. Sometimes I sit there and I get a little frustrated because I don't find myself enjoying certain things. I was into Drake and all this crap, all this shit that they funnel in your ear. Now, I don't listen to any of that shit. I think it's a disease. So where you're at right now, how much you guys done in revenue total? What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode, man. I'm, I'm excited. I got someone that's become a friend, someone that I would always see your ads and I'd be like, who is this dude? <laughs> if I'm being honest. Um, but Jason Wojo, brother, it is a pleasure I'm excited to be to here with you, man. It's been a long time coming and I'm so happy we were able to make it happen while you had your event here in Miami. Um, dude, there's so much to unpack here, but the one word that comes to mind when I think of you, if I would be honest, it's controversial, <laughs> right? That, that would be the word and we'll get to some of that stuff, but really it's paid, it's just paid traffic and, and traffic in general. Mm -hmm. What I'm really interested in knowing first off at such a young age, 26, which we're both 26, how are you able to get to where you are right now at such a young age? Let me tell you the reason why I'm asking that question. I once called a mentor of mine, I was like 22. And I was like, who would ever wanna buy from me? I'm just 22 years old. And he said, nobody gives a rat's ass about your age. They just care about the value that you can provide to them. So for you, what were the steps that you took? You can both tactically, mindset wise, whatever it may be, that enabled you to finally cross that seven figure and now eight figure, congratulations on the ClickFunnels Thanks, award. <laughs> but what were those steps that you took that even at a young age, most people would look at you and be like, how do you do that? For you, you make it look easy, right? So what was that journey like? Yeah, so I think the the biggest piece in the beginning was actually finding one trait that most people skip. Um, when they're young, they think that, you know, they should just stay young and be innocent. I figured, let me figure out like my self-awareness. Um, and that's one skill that I've always used to, to leverage my skill sets and just like personality and um, the network and whatnot. Um, if I didn't know where I best fit, then I was always like, not really a facade, but trying to formulate myself and shape myself in something that I wasn't. So like what environments did I thrive in? What skill sets did I enjoy doing? What people did I like being around? Um, what tasks and like activities did I enjoy? So that was the first thing, like when I was younger, cause I was so innocent that I had all this time to think in the world because I was living at home. I was going to business school. Um, that was after my whole culinary dropout session. Um, and I just had time to think and like harness skill sets. The, the biggest thing that makes it easier for entrepreneurs when they're first starting out is if you don't have skill sets, then it's harder for you to really like bridge the gap for you to go from like zero to hero. A lot of entrepreneurs, when they first start, they try to acquire this one thing and one thing only when being a seven, eight figure entrepreneur requires a completely different skill set and a completely different wallet and individual. So first is the ability to sell like, Sales was important for me to learn. Um, two was words and psychology, which then led into copywriting. Three was being able to articulate like big complicated tasks into smaller goals. I feel like a lot of people overwhelm themselves with like these big goals that they wanna hit and it's just overwhelming for the common individual. Also, I think it was just my resilience to just stay consistent. Like consistency is so underlooked. It's this thing that we just say online, like, oh, just stay consistent and just like, you know, keep doing the same thing over and over again and you'll get a better result over time. And it's like the consistency actually shapes the way for you to outcompete everybody else who isn't willing to stay consistent. Five, six years ago, dude, when we started Wojo Media, I was probably one of like 20 people that I knew that had an ad agency. And now I feel like I'm the only person left who still runs one because everybody else dropped off because they quit or they got bored or they got shiny object syndrome. The consistency is in, is in multiple facets. Um, also, dude, I had no choice. Like putting my back against the wall in this way of 
I have to make it work because I have no plan B. Like when there's no plan B and there's only a plan A, it's kind of hard to kind of fall out of the the path of what you're doing. Um, it was just this, this weird road for me where I just put my head down and I didn't like pick my head up and, and wait for a result. Like I just kept doing the same thing over and over again. And while the definition of insanity is a bad thing because there's no change involved, like I just kept doing and doing it because I knew I was good at it. It wasn't consistently knowing that it wasn't a result. Like I was getting a result. I was just insane with the fact that like I just didn't care about anything else. And that brings me to the last piece, which is sacrifice. While everybody in their 20s is usually like going out and partying and chasing women and and spending money on dumb things. Like, dude, I just acquired skill sets and decided to go all in on me and like not get distracted. And that's a big thing. Um, I feel like with all the instant gratification in the world, all these different apps, the short form content, like it's easy to get distracted. All these different business models. Like, dude, you could have done affiliate marketing. You could have done SMMA. You could have done an Amazon FBA store, but you didn't because you stayed on the track of one thing. Most entrepreneurs are doing five, six different things and each one gets done 15% as well. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's basically just this spider web of just distractions and shit. And it's like, it's not scalable. And I think that just me doing one thing, one thing only allow me to get to the top of the niche. When it comes to consistency, I feel like a lot of people struggle with that because they allow their emotions to get in the middle of that consistency. I don't feel like it. I don't want to do it. My girlfriend broke up with me. How do you detach emotionally from your business, personal life that allows you to continue to stay consistent in those tasks? Because I think that's the hard part for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, I think one is the accountability, not just in like self accountability, but in spending money. Like, I feel like it's easy for me to say yes to things that are worth the investment. Like, I've never really sat there and it's funny, dude, because like I literally paid you, but like I don't run from invoices. Like I've never (laughs) ran from an invoice before because the accountability and paying for it means that I have to use it. If I don't pay for it or I don't inquire about it, it means that there's no need for it. It's not that important on the priority scale. And for me, like if I pay for it, now I have to use it. And that's the whole, like, accountability is derived in two pieces. One is, is it could be something that I know I need, but like no one's really charging me for it. So I'm just going to keep thinking that I need it and keep hacking away at it at small amounts, or I can just, you know, grow a pair and I can just pay for the thing and get it done faster. And the accountability and spending the money, make sure that you have to do it. Like that was always my methodology. That's why my favorite thing is everyone's an entrepreneur until the invoice comes. It's one of my funniest quotes. Because people will say they need something. They're like, yeah, I need help with this. Like you have to be open to people who are willing to give you a tip. That's the whole point of you reaching out. Like any, any mentor that's ever worked with you or myself, we are open to them giving us a tip. Like, Hey, what do you think I should do in this situation? Cool. It's going to cost you X. Oh, now you don't want the help. You asked for the help. And I feel like all the fear and scarcity, it's just beyond paying for the thing. Just get it. Like, Every problem I've ever solved has never been with my bare hands or working harder. It's just been by paying people who are smarter than me. Like, I don't know how to find podcasts. I don't know how to cold outreach. Pay someone else who knows how to do it. I don't care about the price tag. I just want a good relationship and to get the service. That's all I really care about. Mm -hmm. But people look at that and they're like, oh, the price and is it really worth it? Blah, blah, blah. Like, dude, you weren't going to do it anyway on your own. And even if you were, you would have bottlenecked yourself trying to figure it out and going through all the trials and errors. You could just pay somebody to get it done faster. And that was always my, my whole methodology around accountability. The more yeses I say to people who can help me, the more no's I can say to the things that I want to say no to. Like when you get to a certain point in your business where you're scaling and growing, saying the word no is probably one of the most important things that you can do. But people are such yes man, yes woman, whatever. What do you mean by that? So like there, there's just times in my business, like three, four years ago where I was saying yes to everybody. Like, you know, I mean, I wasn't doing the numbers I do now, but I was still doing well. And I was saying yes to those 20 minute zoom calls that I know I shouldn't be taking the, those 30 minute coffee sessions where someone flew in town and I barely knew them, but I met with them anyway. Like these things that I was saying yes to that were bringing me zero value, but I felt guilty if I said no. And once I got past that whole phase of like, Hey, like, my time's valuable. Like I should deserve what I want to say yes and no to. And also when you get to that point where you built your business to where it is, you deserve to do what you want because you did all of the shit in the beginning to now get your time back. And once I got past that, 
I was a lot happier because I was less stressed about pleasing everybody. And I feel like I was gifted with that because I did a service-based business. Like we're both in services. Like when you deal with, we've worked with 1300 business owners. Like, dude, you just realize that people are exhausting, like full heartedly. They are exhausting and they try to rip the absolute life out of you sometimes. And it's just like, it's tough, dude. Uh, I just came to that point in my life where I just want peace and quiet. And like, I don't want all the commotion. I don't want all the camaraderie. I want the camaraderie for my art, not what I'm doing. I like the art in what I do, not the actual result in what I do. So I need some help. <laughs> so you said a couple of things that really resonated with me, some around clients and, and it could be exhausting and, and so forth like that. I think the one thing is sometimes I sit there and I get a little frustrated, frustrated because I don't find myself enjoying certain things. And I sometimes doubt myself and mm -hmm. I'm like, is this really for me? Because I get so frustrated and caught up. Is that normal or? <laughs> it is normal, but dude, when I was getting out of the, like you start to get a little agitated though. Yeah. Like when you're done with that conversation or that situation that you just dealt with and then you're like mad about it, that's a good indication to write it down. And this mm. is what I did. I just wrote it down. I was like, all right, here's what I don't want to do anymore. And then once the page was full, I hired somebody. I just made my first big hire for that. That was great. Dude, it's, it's going to free up your time, give you more headspace, allow you to be a little bit happier and like buy your time back. So when I was tired of onboarding calls, okay, I don't want to do onboarding calls anymore. Second was strategy. I don't want to do strategy anymore. Okay. Uh, this client complained about this. Okay. Don't want to do that anymore. And after that list got really, really long, it allowed me to then just like give myself up and give it the control to find somebody else to do it. Cause you get to your wits end, like not just in business, but in life in general, like you get to your wits end with things. And then you realize that it's really not worth it, but you got into serves in the beginning. So the world and entrepreneurship wants you to believe that you have to make everybody happy. Like mm. you have to get on that call and make people happy because you don't want people to be mad at you. Or you don't want people to be mad at you because you decided to say no when your fiduciary duty is to service the client and you don't want to have a bad name or a bad rap. But dude, there's one thing that people struggle to do, which is have boundaries. Like dude, boundaries are so hard because we think about boundaries as like relationships, you with your girl or you with your wife, whatever that looks like. But it's the same thing in business. Like it's, it's something that I had to learn the hard way, dude. I, I gave my phone number out to everybody and I was like, oh my God, dude, my old A45 number, that phone is destroyed. Just, it has 6,000 texts. I gave it to everybody. Clients were messaging me at nine o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night. And I was like, damn, like this is getting a little bit out of hand now. And like you wake up in the morning and your phone's loaded with just requests, inquiries, questions. Like it was just overbearing for me. And I realized that I couldn't scale if I couldn't get rid of that and systemize that. Cause those are literally just, and this is a big thing that I talk about in sales is when people ask you questions or try to get to the man or talk to the owner, there's two things that people want, which is reassurance and clarity. That's all they're contacting you for. They're not contacting you because they're mad. They just want reassurance and clarity. And if you give people those two things, they'll back off that that's all they want. And I realized that and I was like, all right, let's get a customer success manager. Let's get a strategy lead. Let's get all these things in place so that I don't have to deal with that. And like now, dude, like I don't get my phone number out, not anymore shit. Um, and I just like the most texts I'll ever wake up to are like two, which is usually my mom or like Casey. That's about it. And then other than that, dude, the day is just set and it's great, dude. Also, you have to like figure out though, like this person that you're hiring, once they come in, you have to make sure like when you start building a team team and people start taking leadership roles that you make sure that they're instilled motivation. Like there needs to be an area for them to grow. Biggest thing and biggest mistake I made when I was hiring was I would just hire somebody and be like, Hey, here's what you're making. Um, and yeah, here's how cool the company is. And then like, they never knew that there was incentive or KPI bonuses and all this stuff. Like I didn't realize that these things were valuable core values and all this stuff that dude is so important now with a team of 58, like people care about that stuff because they have families and children and wives and husbands and they want to go on vacation and they want a nicer car and they want all these things. So it was something that I had to learn the hard way. So when bringing someone that's new into the company, how do you onboard them? What does that look like? So, um, First off, we do a three-step interview. Mm. So like the first interview is figuring out like what their goals are. 
Second interview is tactics. So like if I put you in a situation, what would you do? And then third is usually where we discuss pay and, and incentives. The reason why we do that is because if you're not situa like situationally aware and you're not good at like being able to pivot and adjust and you can't do certain situations and you don't know your goals, you're not going to be able to sit there and actually like be comprehensive about your pay. You're going to be a headache. So that's why we do the three-step interview. Um, once they're onboarded, um, number one is they're shadowing either the person they're replacing or they're going through trainings, through Trainable. We use Trainable as a platform. Um, and then three is, is they're doing like, because while they're shadowing, that's mostly what the training is, but then three, they're going through SOPs. Like how the systems work, they see the client journey, they're able to see how that, like let's say we're hiring a strategy lead, they're gonna shadow, you know, Sean or another strategy lead, and they're just working with them for three weeks. Three to four weeks, you're doing situational stuff with clients, you're learning what that person's doing, like you're on Zoom with them for nine hours a day for three weeks straight and just watching them daily. Which, when you're scaling as a business owner, you're literally paying somebody for the whole first month just to learn. Like you're not getting any labor out of them whatsoever. Right. You're just seeing how they react. Okay. Because, dude, there will be hires where you hire them the first week and they're duds. They did really well during the interview. They told you what you wanted to hear, you know, like, and it sounded great and it sounded crystal clear, but then it completely went south. So, like, learn to hire fast and fire fast. That was a big thing for us. Um, because, like, dude, there's hires that we have now where we're slowly weaning them out because they're not really performing that well anymore. And we're like, okay, back to the drawing board. Um, another big thing, like, this is value for everybody is, Big thing that we've seen with leadership and anything that's higher up in a company is, dude, the best hiring platform is LinkedIn. I don't care where else you hire, Indeed, Monster, all these things. Like, dude, LinkedIn has worked the best hands down. It is a night and day difference. And you don't want to know why it's a night and day difference because you have to pay $90 a day to advertise your job on LinkedIn. Oh, really? And nobody wants to do that because they don't want to pay to play. That was the biggest differential. Dude. We put the credit card in there and you're just getting applications like, freaking wildfire. LinkedIn has been a game changer for us by far. So in terms of those SOPs, I'm curious, how do you create them? Is it a Google doc? Do you guys do loom videos with a Google doc? Like what does yeah. that look like for yeah, you Yeah, All the SOPs, they're Google doc step-by-step. And then in between the steps are hyperlinks to, to loom videos. Got it. Cool. That makes sense. I want to talk about a problem I'm having. A lot of people listening might have this problem as well. So man, my stuff scaled really fast. Mm -hmm. To be honest, it was kind of scary. <laughs> yeah, it was scary. And and now I'm getting ready, ready to run ads. There's a little part of me that's scared. What if it breaks? What if I can't handle the fulfillment? What if clients' results suffer? Because I'll be honest, I had a couple of clients, one or two, and um, they weren't 100% happy. And mm -hmm. to me, I took that personal. Yeah, and it, it really, it really affected me. Like yeah. it really, really did. And for a couple of weeks, I was just really down on myself. I, I kind of consulted a couple people. They were like, man, that's, that's part of business, bro. Um, so I've kind of come to accept that. But how do you handle scale while ensuring that fulfillment stays at the level that you need it to stay at? So biggest thing to keep in mind is that you have to look at the situation of why the clients weren't happy though. Right. So like, why weren't they happy? Was it... Cause dude, like I, I had a great experience. So here's the thing, dude. And this is just a, a personal for people who are listening to this is like, when you're in services, man, some people are happy and some people are unhappy. And when they're unhappy, there's two things that happen. One is they can just be unhappy because they just have really high standards. Number one, which is great for some things, but not great for others. And two is dude, is that some people are just really fucking needy. And they just can't tolerate the simple fact that humans are humans and we make mistakes. Right. So don't let that be too hard on yourself and be like, oh, like the clients weren't getting results. Like also like you're in a service where you're pitching people to be on a podcast. So technically it's like your results are actually in the hands of the other podcast hosts who are going to accept them. So if someone doesn't get accepted, it's because they suck. That's just my personal opinion. Like, I'm just being honest. So if they don't get accepted, your bio wasn't good enough. Right. Your, your topic wasn't good enough. Your past clips on your story weren't good enough. Maybe their organic posting wasn't good to where they're like, hey, I want to have this person on. And people don't want to accept the truth that their shit wasn't ready. So that's actually something that I wouldn't blame fulfillment on. That's something I would look at sales for. 
Mm. So either there wasn't this thing that you did on the call to find out that that client wasn't massively qualified yet, or we could have just sold them a smaller package. I think, I think I know what it was. It was just, I didn't really set expectations like I should have. So can you talk to that for a minute? How yeah. important is expectation management and setting at the outset, starting from the sales call? How important is that? And how do I do it correctly? Because now that I'm going forward, that's like my number one priority. Onboarding, make sure it's done mm -hmm. correctly. Uh, so how do I how do I tackle that? Do you do, I mean, when you onboard me, do you, don't, do, you do slides? No. Okay, so I'll, I'll send you my slides so you can use them. But like we have onboarding slides. So like when we're on the onboarding call, we're literally reading word for word the expectations. And we record the call and then we place that recording of the video in their, in their Slack channel. Mm. So they can't ever go back and be like, you didn't tell me this. So that's a, that's a big thing to do, number one. Number two is during the onboarding, you need them to actually agree with what you said. Mm. So if you say, hey, um, in, the, in the first 60 days, I'm going to be doing a lot of research and I might be able to land you three to five podcasts in the first 60 days. Do you understand that that's just an average that I'm giving you, right? Agree. And you get them to actually small commit and agree throughout the onboarding call. Because if they don't commit or agree, like, dude, the biggest thing with setting expectations is actually this simple. You're talking to a three-year-old. Because most people, dude, even though they're 35, 40 years old, they run a business, like most people are still children. Regardless if they like to hear it or not, they are because they set their own expectations when you don't set it for them. And I always give averages, man. It's like, you know, for example, like when we tell clients, hey, you're probably going to launch in seven to 10 business days, but you have to understand that you bought three days ago and you just onboarded today. Those three days don't count. And also there's a holiday coming up and a weekend right ahead of us. So do not do this whole needy bullshit. Don't do this. Okay, I want to make this very clear. Do you understand? And then they say, yes. Like you have to do weird things like that on onboarding calls because they will set their own expectations and they use it against you because what do they start doing? When they take their own expectation, they start haggling for free shit. Like, oh, you didn't promise me that. Um, Can we get an extra month for free? Like, no, you're a child. Okay, you're not getting free shit. So it's this thing where like they just do their own expectation and it's aggravating because dude, I get where you're coming from. I get that a decent amount where they will, if you don't set it, do they set their own? Yeah. Um, because we're in the online space and it's a gift and a curse. The online space has dictated this notion that, um, like, because it's online, everyone's supposed to be on the same page and friendly, right? Oh, he's selling something online. So am I like, I'm, I'm going to be his friend now so I can take advantage of him. Like, no, uh, we all run businesses. We all have systems and people have to respect that. And it's just like, I just don't understand. Yeah, I, I think that if you set expectations, you get them to agree. And also like, you get them to sign a contract because I signed one. Yep. I would probably do a contract signing call at the price points that you're charging because I'm pretty sure you're going to raise prices soon. I would take a guess you probably should. Yeah, or I you have are. Since, okay. since we work together. Yeah. So when you're raising your prices past that mark, um, you should probably have a call where they sit down and go through it with you and you just record it. Go through the agreement. I would go through the agreement with them and set expectations on the agreement. And mm. then those would reflect the onboarding call. So when you're not, when you're on the onboarding call, you can then say, Hey, listen, here's what we spoke about when you sign your agreement, it's in your agreement as well. So now you're double confirming and crossing the two together. Um, the other thing is during onboarding, here's a really important piece is that people don't want to feel like you just sold onboarded. And then you take some time to fulfill. So a big thing with your service where people could feel uneasy, which I didn't care, but is that you pay and then you have to wait three weeks to get a small result. You have to find something quick for them to get a quick result or they might get buyer's remorse. Mm -hmm. They might buy it and then be like, well, Devin hasn't done anything yet. So I can just buyer's remorse and get a refund. You should really think about having somewhere where the client gets a quick win. So I would actually focus on getting another person in the business who does podcast outreach and just have podcasts in queue Yeah, where you have like, you know that you're going to have 10 sales calls this week and you're probably going to close three people. You should have three podcasts lined up. Like I would do something with, 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 with this to where you can always funnel them to Miami at this exact studio to where you know that, Hey, I can always hit up Andrew and Andrew has a podcast lined up for these three clients. I'm going to close this week. Right. So that would be a good thing too, because that's going to be a quick win. Like if I was sold 
and then you said, hey, you should expect a podcast win by next week, but then you send it to them the next morning, bro, activation. Mm. You're surprising them, activation is through the roof, and that's when they're so happy, what do you then do? Referral. Referral. You ask okay. for a referral. That's the game, dude. You got to give them a quick win. That's what we saw. Like when we took them on as ad clients, we went through their ad account, shot a loom video, or we checked out their store and gave them strategy on a call. Like, hey, here's what we're going to do to optimize your conversion rate. It wasn't this thing where we're just going to wait seven to 10 days. They would have been pissed. Yeah. So you got to do that. Um, I mean, the other thing too is, dude, you shouldn't have a big issue though with expectations at scale because you're charging a higher price point. Those people who can pay that dude, like, yeah, there's going to be a batch. I know, you know, there's always sour grapes. Um, but like there shouldn't be a massive issue. Um, also the expectation part is actually in the product itself. So like you should think about releasing three tiers, not just one tier. And the three tiers are outlined on a pricing chart to where the client always has them in their email or you texted it to them, wherever it looks like. So they always have an expectation to look at as well. And it's always crossed to the agreement. It's always crossed to the onboarding slides. If all three are congruent, then those congruent tiers then have to be relayed to your CSM. So the customer success manager has to be on the same page with what those three tiers are. And you don't want them on an onboarding call promising something that wasn't congruent on the three because then you're gonna have incongruency which will then lead to bad expectations. Yeah, yeah. that's a lot. A lot of good stuff. I appreciate that, man. Thank you. Yeah, of course. So when, when you're scaling then, <clears throat> let's talk to agencies real quick. That's your world. So how, then how do you handle that fulfillment without everything? Like, it, like I, I was asked a question recently. They said, if your business doubled tomorrow, can you handle it? I was like, truthfully, no. Dude, neither, right? neither could we. It's like how, like when you were scaling, how did you maintain client results without, you know, how did you maintain those results while scaling? Cause in my mind it's like, damn, like if 20 people came in tomorrow, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do. How do you do that? So. I might be weird about this, but dude, there was one thing that I actually did do that's very interesting. So in the beginning, dude, I had this weird goal in my mind that I wanted to be able to have high margins and make a lot of money on my own. It's kind of and how I, uh... this will resonate with you. <laughs> this is what I did, dude, because I needed enough cash to know that I could pivot if I needed to. If I was about to scale, I'm putting money to ads and I got to have money to, to actually hire. Where was I comfortable? I waited until I had quarter of a million dollars in my checking account. That was my thing. Okay. Let me get a quarter mil in my checking account so that if I want to run ads, I take 10 grand out. And if I want to hire five people pretty quickly, here's 50 K that I can set aside. So I'm not constricted to be afraid of it collapsing. I give myself leeway and I always wanted to make sure that I had three months of running cash because if I had to pivot at any point, I could take those three months, and be like, yo, I'm good. Mm. Whatever the payroll is, whatever the costs are, your rent, three months of that so that you can scale hard for 90 days. And like a big thing too, man, is right now where you're running it by yourself and you're building SOPs, like you have to put more time into your team than the actual clients. So like you're going to be selling people, which is sick, dude. That's great. Um, you're collecting money. But the actual only way that you're going to keep it long term is if you actually put more time into the team because then the team will be so motivated to where it's two of you or three of you or four of you or five of you to actually serve as a client and not make them pissed. Right. Instead, most entrepreneurs will hire and they still don't trust them yet and they still keep doing their shit. They keep running over the team. You have to put more time into the team because the team is actually, if they're more trained and they're more invested in you, you don't have to feel so bottlenecked. And give it six to eight weeks, you're not going to be working as much as you think. So building SOPs, hopping on calls them every single morning, being available to get on a triage call at the end of the day, like, hey, what do we do today? What do we learn? Um, what can we improve? Sick. Take notes tomorrow. Okay, you know what they got to improve? You're training them tomorrow on what the hell they got to improve. Sally said that she didn't know how to answer a question with a client. Let's get on a call with Sally and the client, and I'm going to watch and spectate this person as they answer the question mm -hmm. and intervene when I have to. You have to instill more time and stop. Don't worry about the client. I wasn't worried about the client because I had enough money saved to where, let's say that person dips, fine, refund, fuck out of here. I'm still good, and I have her. It's kind of where I am right now. So that's where 
I would be more invested in the team than than the actual client because over time your team will overtake your skill set and you won't be worried about the team anymore. Now it's about the client. Man, that's good stuff. So when you were developing your team, I don't know if you're anything like me, but when I was younger, man, I thought I knew everything about leadership. I was like, <laughs> I am John Maxwell. <laughs> I, like, I am he. But I quickly realized that I, uh, boy, you got a lot of work to do. So for you, I know you, you said self-awareness is something that's, that's really big. So looking back on your journey, where did you have to develop the most as a leader when you were scaling? And I understand you're still continuing to scale, yeah. but then where do you feel like you have to develop now as a leader in order to go to the next level? So dude, the, the best part is that you're actually in a very good niche to make it easier. Um, the fastest way that I was able to become a leader was actually just by building the personal brand more. When you're trying to attract a talent into your business, they want to be a part of what you're doing. Mm. So like, let's do two pieces. For example, you have Devin who just makes money and grows a business and Devin who gets on a ton of podcasts, has cool friends, has a good network, runs events, um, gets a lot of collaborations, gets sponsorships. People like him. They pre-vet him. They're online talking about Devin. Who do they want to work for? They want to work for this Devin. Yeah. Not the one who just makes money. And the big thing with us was when I was just getting clients doing acquisition, it kept churning because nobody wanted to work for me who wasn't a player because I was all about the money. But as soon as I was about building the brand, posting content, doing events, all that stuff that we did last year, dude, the people that we've attracted, companies have probably the worst churn with salespeople by far. It's the right. hardest position to hire for because you got to keep them motivated and away from shiny object syndrome. For the last two years, we haven't had one salesperson quit. Because they're so invested. Like, dude, they're willing to live with me. They're willing to travel with me. Like, dude, they are so invested and motivated just by being in my presence. Because they're like, oh, you're not the person who wants to make money more. You're the person who walks into a room and owns the room. We want to be around that. And like, that was the biggest thing, dude. So what? at what point did you make that shift from it's about money, now I want to start building the brand? Was it like once you hit 100K a month or like... What, uh, what was it for you? Because I hear some people that have two two different angles. One person's yeah. like, star building the brand immediately. Then I got like my friend Tanner and he's like, no, send 100 DMs a day until you're like at 100K a month and then start building the brand. It's like, yeah. at what point did you start making that transition to, okay, now I'm going to start really being the leader, getting out there. You know what's funny though? I sent PBD a question on his app, Manect. And I said, if I was to really scale this, you know, if you were me, what would you do? You know what he said? He said, I would build my influence on social media. Exactly what you just said. Mm -hmm. So at what point would you recommend that to somebody? Is there a certain number or is it just from the beginning? Get out I there would and say, do it. Yeah, I would say a good proof of concept for you to know that you have validity in scaling is, is 100K a month. That's okay. where you have validity. 50K a month to 100K a month is I'm a solopreneur. I do coaching or I sell a really high ticket service to a couple of people a month. But once you get past 100K a month or more, you know there's demand. And now you got to put ads on it to fuel the fire. And mm. that's where you have to realize that like you either want to stay where you are or you want to grow and scale and you want to be a bigger name in the space. And you want like, dude, the, also, no, all bullshit aside, the reason why people scale past 100K a month and they're doing something online is because they have an ego. Like, let's all just be honest. I was honest. just going to ask that. <laughs> like, they all have an ego. They want people to talk about them. Like, no shit, I do too. Like, we all want people to know that we're the guy. You want to be the podcast guy. I want to be the ad guy. And that's just the name of the game. So that ego is what gets us to keep going and going and going and spending money and scaling and growing and getting more revenue and just like always seeing a new number in our bank account. And it's just like, dude, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. It's something that allows us to scale and impact more people. But it's also something that like kind of is a curse. If you get too addicted, you start spending money on dumb shit and then you get in this weird cycle. So I would say hundred K a month. Um, also, dude, like, what if? Like, fuck it. Like, it's worth it to just go for it. Like, why not? You know? Because that's the other reason, too, is like, dude, living in Miami, you just drive around all day and you see a Lambo, a Bugatti, all this stuff. Like, you just get intrinsically motivated. Yeah. You see a yacht that's like 80 feet long. Like, it's hard not to be motivated. So, understanding that, too, will just keep pushing you in, in a whole different trajectory. Um and also, dude, yeah, building brand is going to attract better people, better clients. You're going to get asked to speak at events. You're going to get thrown in group chats with random people who are heavy ass hitters. You're in a very good space for it to be more scalable. Um, 
You just have to make sure that you keep what you're doing on the low low. Like we talked about it before. You were like, oh, you want to talk about events? I'm like, no shot. Because I want no one knowing about how to run <laughs> events because it's so lucrative and no one runs events correctly. And we're able to run events and have a sick row ads. And I don't want anybody swiping my shit. So same thing with you. Like, don't tell anybody how you're doing what you're doing. Like if someone asks you a question, just say, hey, like respectfully, I don't want to discuss that because that's my proprietary knowledge. Like people give it away in low ticket format, right? People give it away on webinars, but what they don't actually do is, hey, let me share with you my screen and I'm going to show you step by step how I do it. No one does that. And there's a reason why. Or they charge 20, 30K for it and they make you sign an NDA and a non-compete and all these things, dude. It's like, I, I'm in that place where I don't need to sell information. Like I need just better clients mm. because the information that I have is valuable for anybody. Also, dude, it's the same thing with like women. It's like when you don't give people what they want, they want it even more. Same thing with women. If you don't give women attention, they want the attention even more. Is it, are are you speaking from experience? I, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like you're dangling the carrot. Um, because you don't want to be the person who everyone's like, oh yeah, Devin sat down with me. He like told me how he was, you know, doing this thing with his team and blah, blah, blah. Like you don't want to be that person. I, you just want to be the person where they say this about you. Hey, I know this guy, Devin, he gets you on podcasts. I don't know how the fuck he does it, but pay him. That's the kind of person you want to be. So there's no loose end. Mm. So where you're at right now, how much you guys done in revenue total? Approximately. About total all time. I think about 18 million. Yeah. It's a lot. It's stupid. Right. <laughs> People think about that and they're like, this dude's amazing. So where you're at right now, where do you feel like you need to grow the most? Where I have to grow the most is probably with being more empathetic about where people are at. What do you mean? Like I'm so like just speed focused that sometimes I forget that the people around me are not as far. And I'm like, yo, like come over here, do this shit. And I'm like, wait a second, that person's not even mindset prepared <laughs> right. to even like go on this journey with me. Like I'm not, I'm not very self-aware in that standpoint. Second thing would be like, yeah, dude, like a lot of people on the internet knew me for controversy and it got me views, but like it didn't attract the right people. So now my next thing I got to work on is like talking about more high level stuff. Like dude, all those things that I talk about in the beginning of this podcast, like that's high level shit. Like you can't watch that and be like, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah, of course. So that's the stuff that I want people to see. Um, because, dude, the knowledge that I have to offer is actually very freaking good. It's just that getting views online is so skewed. It's like, oh, I have to say something controversial to get views, which it's true. Like, you do. Um, but you can say it in a way that also builds brand together. So that's what I would say, too, would be number three is, like, brand building. Like, yeah, like, podcasts, sick, dude. Events, awesome. Um, I just need to keep doing it over and over again and go back to that consistency that I had six years ago. Mm. That same like deliberate, um, consistency of like not caring about the clock, not caring about the money. I now have to do again, but with brand and it's intrinsic. There's no value to it. There's no number. There's no scoreboard. So I'm just doing it and doing it and doing it. It's like the Gary V method. Like you just don't look up until it's finally there. That's deep stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Like you're at this, this different level now, but you still have to go back to what you used to do six years ago. Yeah. That's wild stuff. So. I need help again. All right. Okay, what's up? <laughs> so with these, with these ads, <clears throat> so I'm actually in a position right now where when I look at my market, there's nobody else running ads. Mm -hmm. There's not one other person, not, uh, not one ad that I've seen saying, I will get you booked on podcasts. Is that a good thing? It's a good thing. And also a bad thing because you're going into a blue ocean where you don't know what your costs are going to look like. Mm. So really what you're going to spend money on in the beginning is finding what your costs are going to be. Like you're going into a blue ocean where no one's ran ads in it. And it's probably because they haven't done a good job of fulfilling for it. Mm. So if you have the fulfillment down, then you're chilling, but no one's seen the ads for that yet. And you might get like, and this is just me being transparent. You're going to get a bunch of no name fucks who just want podcast placements who have no money. Yeah. Like your, your lead funnel is going to be low cost leads and just basically like people who have 500 bucks to their name. So you have to like really funnel an application. So if I was you, I would do like where they watch a video for 10 to 15 minutes first before they even see an application. 
Make sure they watch a video first. Hey, if you're a six, seven or eight figure entrepreneur and you want to get booked in podcasts to expand your reach, get higher quality clients and grow your social media following and become the number one authority in your space. I am only going to work with you if you have at least 20 K in liquid to spend. And that's how you start the video. And then you talk about the rest of the shit after so that everybody who's like a dumbass just leaves the video after you say the price in the beginning. And is that in the ad or the VSL? That's the VSL. That's the VSL. Cause you still want to drive clicks, right? Okay. but you're still pre-qualifying off like infatuation. Um, the, the other thing too, that you need is an archetype. So like you need to understand that you need to have a story of somebody who went from zero to hero with podcasts. It's going to be, it's going to be something where also you take a six figure entrepreneur and if they went from six figures to seven figures with podcasts, that's your case study. Cause people who make six figures, they can afford it. Right. Or you can provide funding if they're making like 150 a year, maybe they can't spend that much money, whatever. You got to take someone from six figures to seven. And if you know that case study, who's in your head, go fucking pay them to do a video, like pay them to be a part of something like this, where you sit down with them and you do like an interview style. Oh, that's good. Um, I like that. There's one person that I would look at for a VSL type video. Uh, it's the guy who runs eBoov. If you've seen that stuff before, okay, just go look it up and thank me later. It's called <laughs> E-B-O-O-V and it's a software. And if you look up his VSL, he does a podcast style VSL and he calls this software that he uses the Casper method. If you take that same methodology with your VSL, you will be just fine. So go take that VSL, watch it, fucking study it, sit there in your bed at night and fucking just lay there and watch it and just write down the notes of, Hey, how does he start the VSL? What does he talk about one minute in? What does he go into in two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, five minutes? It's like a 30 minute VSL. And you just need to replicate that in podcast form and get that person who is that six figure person went to seven figures and put their ass in that chair and you interview them and do that exact VSL. And that's going to be the thing that they have to watch. And then once they get to 10 minutes or 12 minutes, then you say in the video, if you're, you know, if you're sitting there still watching, you're excited about booking podcasts right below this video. I just popped up the application form that you can go down below right now and fill out because now I trust that you know what this service is going to look like and you can probably afford it. So go below the video and fill out the app and then I'll see you on the calendar if you qualify. And then, then you just run ads to so just literally headline and video. And that's it. That's just it. <laughs> this is what a professional looks like. right? <laughs> I mean, I'm like, golly. Well, I, I think that that's super helpful, man. So I, I appreciate that. A limiting belief I think I have, and I'm sure that there's a lot of people that, that would have a limiting belief like this. Will cold traffic pay those prices? They will. Yeah. What makes you say that? I mean, I get people who spend money to spend the day with me. They'll buy podcasts for, I don't know what your new prices are. I don't want to reveal them on here so people aren't fucking price jabbing. But if they're around that range, yeah, they'll spend money on cold traffic. Okay. Yeah. The only thing I'd say is that you're going to probably have a two call close. Yeah. At the prices you're at, you're going to have to book the call, set her calls them, says, hey, I'm really excited to see if you qualify to be on top tier podcasts. I just want to ask you a couple questions before I put you on Devin's calendar. Is that cool? You have a couple minutes. Okay, sick. Um, one is how many followers do you have and how many pieces of content you're posting per day? Sick. Two is, have you been on podcasts before? Are you comfortable being on camera? Sick. Three is, um, how much is your marketing budget every single month? Like do you spend money on ads right now? Like, what does that look like? Are you running ads? What? And then four is if you are selling a service, how much is it? And by those four questions, you know, okay, cool. I really appreciate that, that information. Based on those answers, I can put you on Devin's calendar. When are you available today or tomorrow? You take those four questions, you pre-qualify, then you do the second close because at the price point you're at, you want to find out more info. From so am, am I having the setter call them? As soon as they fill a la that application. That app let me ask you with the application. What are questions that people need to have on their application? I mean, they're all just like, they're all questions that are going to predicate where the person is. So let me, let me tell you mine right now. Name, email, et cetera. What's your monthly income? Are you able to invest? Okay. So here's the thing about you're going to have drop off there because you're, right. you're going for a question so early where, where it sounds like you don't care about anything else. So what you should do is name, email, phone. What's your website? Um, what, what do you sell? How much are your services? How many clients have you served in, in the last 12 months? What's your Instagram handle? 
what's your average monthly income? Then you go into that because you put the stuff in the beginning to make it seem like you give a fuck about everything else, but you really don't. You just care about their average monthly income. Ah. <laughs> so you do that in the beginning because you just want to feel like they're like needed. And then have the setter as soon as they submit it. Yeah. I know you, I always hear you talk about speed to lead. Yeah. Five minutes, bro. You got to call them in five minutes. Mm. Hey, just got your application in for pod. Let's call it podcast secrets, whatever the hell you want to call. Um, we just got your application and uh, we want to see if you're a good fit. If I can ask you a couple extra questions that weren't on the application, is that okay with you? Sick. And you just go into it. So what do you think when it comes to paid advertising? What is, let me ask you this. What is the question that people should be asking you when it comes to running profitable paid ads? See, that's a good question because I'm about to answer it with a question. Um, I would say, dude, the, the biggest question people should be asking is, what things should I be looking for while I'm spending all this money on ads? Mm. The questions people ask normally are, how fast should I get my first client? How soon should I see an ROI? How fast until I can scale my spend? When should I scale my spend? None of those things matter until you have proven a sales process. Like until you know that you can get people qualified on a phone call who wanna buy your shit, nothing else matters. And when you're running ads, the truth that people don't want to hear is that you have to literally say to yourself, I'm going to burn through 10 grand until I see shit. You have to just sit there and get unattached to 10 G's and throw it out the fucking window. That's literally what you're doing. You're saying 10 grand to ads just to find out if my shit is good or it's product market fit and people want it mm. because you're using that as research. Like you're going from front of the sales process to the back, like, like a conveyor belt in the front. It's, is my offer good? Is my product product market fit? Am I getting high quality applications? How do I find high quality applications? What am I saying in my ad that's turning broke people into my funnel? What do I have to say in my funnel that gets high quality people to say yes? Why are my show rates so low? Am I asking the right questions on the form? Is my setter good? Is her tonality good? Why are people not booking a call after the first call? Like, why are no people closing? Why are people getting approved for funding? Why does no one like my pricing structure or my matrix? Why are people always picking the first tier versus the third? Like, dude, all of these questions are going to happen and you have to find the answers through market data and you have to freaking just blow through money to figure so it out. So are those the questions that one should be asking themselves then? Instead While the spend is running. Hmm. The problem is that the questions are always about the ads. What's the best ad to run? Whatever has a good hook, has a good offer, shows social proof and gets people to take action. Oh, it's that simple. Yeah, because the ad just sells a click. It doesn't sell the buyer on shit. If you could sell your program through an ad, um, I would be fucking talking about buying your business at this point. Like, that's the thing. Like, you can't sell ticket products that high just off an ad. It's got to go to a video that infatuates and storytelling and, and social proof and all these things. And then they go to an app and then there's drop off on the questions. You find out what question people are dropping off on. You plug the hole, change the wording, move the questions. All these things, dude, that people don't want to look at because it's fucking boring. Mm. They don't want to look at that stuff because it's boring. They want to look at the ads because it's sexy. It's click, publish, make money. But when you tell somebody who's a business owner, hey, I want you to go look at your uh, take rate on your third upsell. Oh, uh, why, do, why do I want to look at that? The ads aren't performing. No, you dumbass. The ads aren't performing because no one's taking your third upsell. And that AOV boost that you could be having is going to funnel into your ad spend and make you break even on the front end. Or... Hey, um, why don't we go over some call reviews on why your setter is having such a problem in the beginning of the calls? The setter, what, my, my fucking cost per call is 180. Yeah, we get that, but you could decrease your cost per call if your setter was better. But no one wants to go to those questions because it's high level shit. That's why so few entrepreneurs can hit that, that six to seven figure a month range because they just, they look at all of the, like the stupid, simple stuff that's sexy. But all the boring stuff that takes a while, like right now in our business, when you ask like, oh, where, like, what are our biggest problems right now? And where are we headed? Developing new products. As boring as that sounds, that's actually the most important fucking thing that we are doing. It's not ads. I've been running the same ads for three years straight. The same fucking videos, the same script, the same copy, the same calendar, the same landing page. Nothing has changed for three years. Why? Because the ads don't matter client comes into our ecosystem, why are they leaving at X month? We didn't develop SEO. We didn't have organic. Now we do. We weren't doing email marketing. Now we do. We've been doing that for years since I had that problem four years ago. 
Why are the clients not spending more money and staying? Find those holes, plug them with products that you can then offer to keep people happy. But no one wants to do that. Some high level shit. Yeah. <laughs> but no one wants <laughs> to do that shit. high level shit. Golly. And honestly, dude, like, it's funny because I, I have coaching programs. I, I do mastermind. I have events. Like, bro, I'll get 110 people in a room. I will tell them exactly what to fucking do. We just ran our event. We had 110 people in the room. I gave them so much value. Bro, are, are you... 99% of them won't do shit with the information that I gave them. 99% of them won't do a damn thing and they know they won't because they're lazy. They feel entitled. They want it done for them, but they won't pay the fucking invoice. And... They just don't see value in themselves. They have a self-belief issue because they don't actually believe in the product or service. If someone is on a call with you or at, is at an event and they don't want to invest in what you're offering, but they know you're the key to their success, it's because they don't believe in what they're, they're selling themselves. If they knew that if they got on podcasts that they would get people to buy their stuff, they would pay you. They just don't pay you because they don't believe that if they got on a podcast, people would buy their stuff because their stuff sucks. And that's the truth. So how does someone de develop that belief? Is it just product improvement? It's product or? improvement, but most people who sell shit online, they got into entrepreneurship to get rich. They did not get into entrepreneurship to build a good business. No one woke up and said, yo, I want to live in Miami and be an entrepreneur because I want to have a good product. They said, I want to be an entrepreneur and have a good business so I can buy a Lambo, get women, and have a Skyrise apartment. That's what the fuck they said instead. That's the reality, huh? <laughs> well, well, that's what the internet tells us. Yeah, because right? we got guys online who just throw Bugattis and shit at everybody, and they're dangling carrots, bro. Right. It's terrible. You have any idea how hard it is to get to that point of financial fucking success? But we throw it at them, and we dangle carrots. And it's like, dude, it's terrible. One of the things is I hear you speak, you said earlier, and, and I do want to touch on one more kind of high level thing, which is ascension. But you said you don't like all of the commotion. I feel like you're, you're looking for a little bit more peace. How do you cultivate peace in kind of like your, your day to day? Do you meditate? Do you go for long walks? Like, what do you do for yourself personally to keep you grounded? Yeah. Because you have 58 people, let's be real. I don't care how many people you, ha you hire to help you. <laughs> That shit's stressful. Yeah. Right. So what do you personally do to keep yourself peaceful and grounded? So yeah, number one is um, in the morning, dude, I always take a drive and I get my iced coffee. I get my donut and I take a drive in the morning. I go by the water. I feel the wind in my face. I listen to music. I get an hour of me time. Okay. Second thing I do is I like to listen to music while I work. And that some people might say, well, I can't listen to music because I'm on calls all day. We'll find someone to get you the fuck off Zoom. That'd be number one. <laughs> so I always, I always will listen to music because I need that peaceful music. Like uh, Graham, he's a very good like singer songwriter. I like listening to his music, like very slow, soft music. Okay. I'm not into this rap shit now. It's crazy because when I was, see, this is the thing, dude, is that when I was first starting on entrepreneurship, I was into Drake and all this crap. All this shit that they funnel in your ear at clubs and all this junk. Dude, now I don't listen to any of that shit. I think it's a disease. I think it's mm. terrible music and it filtrates your mind with stupid crap about big booties and all this stuff. Like, dude, it's terrible. So now I listen to slow piano music, dude. Let me just focus, get honed in and focus. And then during the day, dude, I, I'm not going to lie. I like getting stimulation. I will go on my phone and I'll study ads for a little bit. I'll swipe. That's my zone of genius. I'll just swipe. I'm looking at, okay, that pattern throw up was cool. I should use that intro. Okay. I'm taking on my notes. I'm just like, I'm trying to get better at my craft because I actually enjoy what I do. The last piece is at night. Personally, dude, I like eating alone. I can't eat with other people, bro. It pisses me off. So like when I go out to eat, one of the weirdest things that people say to me is, yo, why do you go out to eat alone? Here's why. I can't sit in front of somebody and just shoot the shit for an hour and a half. I just can't do it over food. I, I just can't, I, I sit there and I'm like, where the fuck is the door? <laughs> I, I need, dude, I need to be able to sit there and just think about my life for a little bit, because that's the only time in my life where I'm being waited on and my life is in slow-mo and I want to enjoy the food that I'm eating. 
you're also eating with somebody else and like you eat at different paces, you order different shit, you don't want an app, I want an app. I, fuck out of here. I'm just going to order whatever the hell I want. So I always eat alone, dude. It's one of my biggest rules. I guess I'm not going to ask him to go out to eat with me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that that, so, that that does make a lot of sense, though. It gives you what you know what? As I've grown older, I really appreciated. <laughs> yeah, this guy's not getting steak with me. <laughs> so the other thing, too, is I'll only eat in groups that are big, though, because then I have to be in like group mode. Right, but if it's yeah, just yeah. one on one, dude, it's like, fuck. So I just can't do it. So dude. what if you go out to eat with a chick? Oh, that's different because, like, that's leading to something. But, like, that's just different. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I had to make sure. I had to make sure. All right. So, oh, man. Let's, let's talk very briefly. That was the controversial part of me. Let's talk. Um, <laughs> I wanna, dude, I'm always good at getting hooks, dude. This is great. Some I want to <laughs> lastly talk about, I've heard you talk about before, that you're okay even losing money on the front end because you know of what you have on the back end. So what's the, the thought, specifically like the thought process? Let's say a new business owner comes to you, they're at 10K a month, they wanna to scale to 100K a month, they have no back end offer. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's say they have a social media marketing agency, something. How, how, what's the thought process that someone should have about the back end? So the first things first is when you're at 10K a month, you have to realize, and I break it down to really four important parts. So like one is your offer. Like is your offer on the front end actually scalable? Cause they get to 10 K a month. You could just do that organically and people will buy from you because they like and trust you. Not because the market like and trust you. Mm. The market is a, is a wider ocean of like really cold traffic people who have no idea who you are. Are they going to buy what you're selling? Two is like, is your ecosystem overall actually set up for you to be able to scale from 10 to hundred K a month? Like, is your funnel high converting? Is your copy good? Are your infatuations good? You know, is your sales process dialed in? Do you have the right appointment reminders? Are your lead nurtures good? Are your emails good? Like, how are you nurturing every single person who comes to your database? Third is, if you're about to run ads, you, you have to really sell that front end offer that you know will be scalable and convert. The front end offer that converts on the front end will then allow you to find the problem you're then going to create for the audience. So I'll get into that in a second. But then fourth are the KPIs, which are like, what levers do we pull in the business to actually be able to provide you more value in a ROAS when you're running ads so that you can scale to 100K a month? So back to the problem that, that you create. Whatever you sell on the front end is now going to reveal a problem. So for example, for us, our front end is let us run your ads. What problem do we then create? We're going to get you a ton of leads. And you're going to sit there and go, Hey, Jason, I either need email marketing or I need a setter. Okay, cool. We'll find you a setter, pay us three grand email marketing and extra thousand a month. Okay, cool. These are two ascensions because we create a problem for the, for the customer. We want to create problems because those problems, we developed products to provide you the right. solution. You don't want to go anywhere else. So you have to pay us. Now that you have a setter and you have email. You're now going to sit there and go, okay, um, Jason, I'm booking more calls. My setter's helping me. I'm getting higher quality calls, but I can't focus on fulfillment because I'm on sales calls all day. We got to find you a closer. Six grand. And we're just giving you solutions that you can't go anywhere else and pay for. You're not going to want to commingle services. And then you build continuity. And continuity is the reoccurring that you're going to build on. So, you know, reoccurring can be, running more traffic sources because now you have email, a setter and a closer. Now you're going to sit there and go, well, Jason, I'm off sales calls. I'm building a fulfillment team. I want to run more traffic. Cool. Upgrade your package. That's continuity. Then the next level is referrals. So it's like, you're so activated in our ecosystem that now you have a setter. Now you have a closer. Now you have email and you upgraded your package. You're going to send us your, your friends now because you've been fully through this customer journey. And now your referrals cover your ad cost. And that's mm. the whole premise of a customer journey. Then the referral starts back from the beginning again. And the referral is now pre-framed to buy the setter, to buy the closer, to buy the email, to upgrade their package. And then, then that cycle just keeps going and going and going. And that's how I really derive how you would go on that route. But you got to find the irresistible offer on the front end that's going to convert at scale first. Dude. I can't wait to just listen to this again. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, this has been incredible, man. Um, I want to make sure before we end here, where can people not just find you, but more importantly, 
where can people sign up to work with you? Because like, yeah. I just want to make like everyone aware, like I've, I've watched a lot of your stuff online and a lot of the stuff that you went into here, you've really never gone into in depth, this in depth. Yeah. And this just shows like this level of expertise, man. Yeah. So want to acknowledge you for that because that this is some next level stuff. So where yeah. can people find out to learn more about joining you guys and really scaling and growing with your team? Yeah. Um, so if you're a business owner doing at least 10 K per month, uh, and you're looking to bolt on pay traffic, um, we will run your ads. We'll, do your offers, we'll do your landing pages, your product pages, your store optimizations, your funnels, your copy, all these things that encompass a good selling ecosystem. Um, you can go on Instagram at the Jason Wojo and you can click the link in my bio and that's where you can book a free demo call to speak with either myself or one of my senior advisors um, and we'll be able to see if you qualify to work with us. My guy, thank you. Yeah, appreciate you, bro. All right, thanks bro.